Welcome to the Writer's Journey Podcast. I'm Michael Laron, a science fiction and fantasy author on a journey to go from nobody to bestseller, and I'm documenting every step of the way. Tune in every week as I pull back the curtain on my writing life and how I'm building a writing career while working a full-time job, raising a family, and attending law school classes in the evenings. You can find show notes for this week's episode, a free starter library of my fiction, and much more at michaelleron.com. Hello and welcome to episode 125. 125 is a good number, and I titled the name of this episode Beast Mode Equals On because I am transitioning into a new phase of my writing year this year, and so uh, we're going to talk about that. So, But first, real quick, just announcements. I wanted to let everybody know that today, as I record this, I'm recording this a little early this week, but I'm recording it on Monday, July 27th. That is the launch day of my new book, 150 Self-Publishing Questions Answered, Allies, Guide to Writing, Publishing, and Book Marketing that every indie author and and poet needs to know. Uh, Written by me with a uh, foreword by Orna Ross of the Alliance of Independent Authors. So the book is finally live. I know it's been... I've been talking about it for a really long time, but the day is finally here. And so um, you can get your copy at authorlevelup.com slash 150. And for those of you who haven't heard of it, about the thousand times I've talked about it, (laughs) it's a question and answer format book that answers the most burning self-publishing questions. So from the time that you decide that you want to be a writer and you want to pick up the pen and write your first book, all the way down to the time you finished your first book and you need to understand copyright, everything in between. Writing, editing, marketing, formatting, copyright, licensing, this book has you covered. So you can get your copy at authorlevelup.com slash 150. And a huge thank you to my street team, all the people who signed up to get advanced review copies of the ebook and the audio book. I cannot thank you guys enough. Um, It was a lot of people. So um, the, the reviews are starting to come in. Not everyone has had a chance to get through the book yet, and that is totally okay, but just looking at the reviews on amazon.co.uk, my friends across the pond, taking out some of the uh, the reviews that they've left. Uh, Kimberly uh, Shade, I think that's how you pronounce it, she says that uh, 150 self-publishing questions answered is a book for independent authors at any stage in their career. It is well organized into sections and concentrates on particular types of questions. The format makes it easy to negotiate and easy to dip into the content as you need. And uh, Reader Steve says, if you are contemplating becoming an indie author, you simply have to get this book. You'll be pleased you did. If you are an indie author, I'd recommend getting this book as there is a ton of useful information inside. At the time of this writing, I am a year and a half into my indie author adventure, and I have found what Michael says to be absolutely correct. A definite recommend. And Vicky says, Michael brings to this book his own practical experience as well as the knowledge and expertise of the Alliance of Independent Authors. I would like to thank Michael and Ally for producing this fantastic resource. And from my friends over here in the United States, what are we saying? So Marcus says that uh, this book is a terrific resource for writers of all levels who are interested in self-publishing. The chapters are clearly defined into topics, and the information Michael covers is clear and easy to understand and apply to your self-publishing business. And Reader BH says, there are way more than 150 questions answered in 150 self-publishing questions answered. (laughs) I found the topics of the craft, marketing, and copyrights in particular to be exceptionally helpful. And I'll I'll just read one more here. So um, another one from um, Amazon customer, uh, Michael always delivers real information that empowers us to bring our books to life. I keep following him and buying from him because it is always worth my time and attention. Thank you, Michael. So that is just a snippet of all of the reviews that readers are starting to leave. So again, huge thank you to those of you who agreed to read the book in advance and agreed to Um, review the book. It means a lot to me, and I think it's really going to help get the book in front of readers. And um, I know I'm excited about this, and I know Ally is excited. And so uh, keep those reviews coming in and certainly uh, buy the book if you are interested in what it has to say. So big, big day, big launch day. It's always a fun time. So uh, wins for the week. I wanted to let everybody know that my new book for writers is edited, and I have begun the audiobook recording. So the cover is with my cover designer, 
and they're in the process of designing it as we speak. And I'm hoping that they'll be done sometime beginning of next week or so. And um, I'm hoping I'll be able to unveil the title here sometime in the next week or two. Just want to make sure everything gets cleared and, and everything looks good before I do that. But um, this book is technically ready to go anytime. But I don't want to cannibalize the launch of uh, 150 self-publishing questions answered. So it, it's going to be at least until August 27th until it is released. But if you are a Patreon member on my Patreon feed, you will get the book for free much sooner than that. <laughs> so if you're not a patron, you can join at patreon.com slash Michael Laron. So that's my win for the week. My lesson for the week is a lesson that I learned. Uh, this is something I learned about two years ago, but I, I put it into practice again. So one of the one of the smartest things I ever did was something I did on a whim on my YouTube channel author level up. And um, I had I think I was doing I was doing the Scrivener review video or Scrivener versus Ulysses video. And I didn't know at the time that they would be my most popular uh, videos on my channel of all time. So I was building these and I, and I thought, oh, maybe they'll be maybe they'll be popular. People will find them interesting. Why don't I promote one of my books at the beginning? And so I happened to see a YouTuber who I think at the very beginning of of uh, like one of his videos, he put together this 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 like really nice ad of like stock footage and really hip music, and he narrated over the bottom of it, and he's like, "Please get this book here. You can get your copy at blah blah blah." And so it was like all these happy, smiling people, you know. So I was like, "Okay, I'll tr I'll try it. It's kind of cool." So I I went and got um, stock footage. Of like the happiest smiling people who were reading books and listening to audiobooks that I could. And I put them all together and I spliced them together and I, I said, This video was brought to you by my book, Be a Writing Machine. And it was, you know, and um, I put it in front of the Scrivener versus Ulysses cage match video. That video blew up and that, the rest is kind of history for my book, Be a Writing Machine. That is the reason a lot of people found that book was because of. Uh, that ad. So the power of pre-video ads is a very important thing. And um, I think I just learned it, it's it, it, it's cool to be able to take an idea that someone else is doing and apply it to your situation and get real meaningful results. So anyway, idea of the week. This is an interesting one. And I know, I know of at least one book out there that kind of maybe does this. Um, but what I'm, I'm looking at is, is something a little bit more in depth. So I've been reading a lot about neuroscience and the biology of technology, so like biohacking and, and all this really fun futuristic stuff. And as I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, we have a lot of books in the writing community. We've got books on writing craft. We've got books on writing business. Uh, we've got books on entrepreneurship and, and marketing. And we've got all these really great niche books on different subject matters like 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 an attorney writing a book about the law for writers or a pol police officer writing a book about police procedure for writers or you know those sorts of things and i think it would be really interesting if there was someone out there who wrote a book someone who's qualified i should say who wrote a book about neuroscience and the biology of writing and reading isn't that fascinating i mean we we don't know very much at all about what happens, and at least I don't know, and maybe you might know, but I don't know, <laughs> what happens to readers' brains when they read books? What happens to writers' brains when they read books? Um, I'm sure that there's some researcher out there somewhere behind the walls of some university who's, who's made this their life's work <laughs> to, to look at the, the biology of writing and reading books. And wouldn't that be a fascinating thing to learn about? And um, I just don't know of any books out there other than... Um, I think it's Wired for Story by Lisa Crone. Um, that that's the only book I can think of that really gets gets at what I'm going for, and I just think it would be interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of Srini Pillay. He's a he's like a neuroscientist, and he does a lot of like public speaking and talks about the power of brain science and and you know productivity and and leadership and all that. I think it would be a really interesting, really interesting thing um, to apply to writing. And what might we be able to learn from that? So, all right. So topic of the week. I, I titled this topic, uh, Beast Mode Equals On. <laughs> um, it's an homage to a football player here in the United States who uh, coined the term Beast Mode. And um, 
what I wanted to talk about is how I am between chapters of my writing career right now and possibly what's to come. So, you know, when I first started this year at the um, beginning of the year, before the world went to hell in a handbasket, I said, you know, this is going to be a production year for me. I'm going to write as many books as I can, and I'm just going to try to kill it because 2019, I didn't really, or 2018, I didn't really produce as many books as I wanted to. 2019, I didn't produce as many books as I wanted to. And so I wanted to start bulking up my catalog again because, you know, that's one of my skills. I'm really good at creating a lot of content. And so I said, this is going to be a production year. And then everything happened. And then I said, you know, that's probably not a good idea. Um, I'm going to make this an infrastructure year. And I wanted to make it an infrastructure year mainly because I want to make sure that I merge from all of this in a pretty good position, but also because it's less money <laughs> to, to have it be an infrastructure year. Although I have invested quite a bit into my business so far this year. And so as I look at the last, as I look at the first quarter of the year, um, the first two months, which were fairly normal, last month eaten up by the beginning of the pandemic. And then I look at the second quarter of the year, which was all infrastructure. So building my book database, building um, my sales database, um, a couple other things that I that I was working on. Now, as I move into the, the third quarter, semi fourth quarter, I do need to do some production. So meaning I do need to get some books out. So Starting August 1st, my beast mode is going on. <laughs> I'm going to be producing content like crazy. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what I'm going to produce yet, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to be producing content like crazy. So I've taken this week, which is July 27th through, I think August 1st is the end of the week, um, or the 31st is the end of the week. I've taken this time um, to go into kind of like mini beast mode. So I've produced a lot of YouTube videos. Like today, I'm, I'm like super tired because I literally sat down and, and produced uh, six YouTube videos, <laughs> which is a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> and tomorrow, I'm going to shoot those six videos that I sat down and, and figured out what I was going to shoot on. And those are going to go to my editor. And so it's going to be um, it's going to be a busy week in that regard. Um, I've I've got this going. I'm recording this early so that I can squeeze some things in. I'm going to try to see if I can knock out the audiobook for this new book that I'm doing in two sessions. So I don't know if I'll be able to do that, but I'm going to try so that when I hit August 1st, I can just hit the ground running with books. So I'm probably going to pick up with uh, book two of my Good Necromancer series. I'm going to just jump into that. I may even just jump into book three of the Good Necromancer right after that because I want to produce pretty quickly. I have found that this series doesn't... It doesn't write itself very quickly, so that's that's going to be something that I, I'm going to have to figure out. Um, but yeah, I, I want to write a lot of books this year. Um, so I, I don't know if I talked about this on the show, but um, um, I, I'm, I put my law curriculum on hold this semester because my law school wanted me to come to person to, to campus in person for my next class. Apparently only one class I can take <laughs> this semester. And they wanted me to be in the, at, at the law school in person. And I said, to hell with that. I'm not, you're not going to get me in the law school right now. Uh, I'm not going to be around people. It's just crazy. So I told him, listen, I'm not going to do it. So um, I'll talk to you next semester when, you know, maybe you offer something online. <laughs> maybe you don't, <laughs> but I'm not going, you're not going to get me there this fall, especially when we're talking about resurgences and stuff. No, no way. Hell no. So I said, you know what? I'm I, if, if I'm not going to have a law class this semester, I'm going to produce as much content as I possibly can. So um, I want to, August 1st up until right around the beginning of November, I want to have a solid production quarter. So I'm still going to be working on infrastructure, and I'll talk about that, what I'm going to be working on here in a moment, um, but it's going to be primarily production and marketing. So doubling down again on Amazon ads. I doubled down on it big time in March. I'm going to double down on it again um, in the next couple weeks and then see if I can increase my income, increase my earnings, maybe run some sales, do some stuff like that. So that way, you know, this has already been my best year ever, but just because it's my best year ever, that doesn't that doesn't mean that I want to sit on my laurels. I need to have more content. I need to get that out into the world. And so I'm a writer. You know, the podcast and the YouTube channel and all that stuff that comes second to because I wouldn't have all of that if I didn't write books, right? So I want to write a mixture of fiction and nonfiction and 
uh, create some other content because I know that that's one of the reasons that you all follow me. You know, I don't want to say that I'm the author of over 50 books for, you know, for 30 years. <laughs> I want to get to 100 books and then 150 books. And so uh, it's time to start doing that. So I'm going to be writing quite a bit. I'm going to be reading fiction quite a bit. Um, I've, I've read a lot of fiction this year, but I'm going to be reading more because um, that helps me get into the mindset of reading more. So I will be documenting that journey and, and sharing sharing that process as we uh, move into the next few weeks here. So uh, this is an infrastructure year for me for sure, and it has been uh, without a doubt, but I do need to get some production out that will help, um, I think, help keep my sales up through the end of the year and also lay the groundwork for more books that are going to make me more money over the long haul. So um, pop, pro production quarter, that, anyway. <laughs> so what I also wanted to talk about was what I was going to start building with my next infrastructure piece. So I, I, I got into the middle of Author Income Dojo, and I, I was working through it, and it's working great, but I, I, I wanted to wait on it a little bit because there were, some little, there were some little refinements and things that I want to consider making in the future, but I don't know quite how to make them yet. So what I decided is that um, now that I've got everything built and I'm using it and I'm running with it, I want to try to use it for at least a year so that I can get a sense of what I need to build with this. Um, and then in a year, we'll see if it still makes sense to continue to do. Um, maybe things will have changed in the sense that maybe I can do something that will work for Mac users. But um, I just the timing has to be right. Um, and also, I'm going to have to spend time supporting it. And so if I'm going to do that, I really need to make sure that um, it's going to be um, something that everybody can use. And quite frankly, it's something that only a small percentage of my audience will use. And so as I think about business priorities and I think about um, what's going to bring in the most income, just just be frank with you, be honest, um, I have to think about um, uh, other projects that maybe will get me more bang for my buck. So it's not saying the end to it. It's just I want to make sure that when I do it, the timing is right and that it is going to be executed on a very high level that you guys expect from me. So um, just kind of a transparent decision making thing and because um, it, it would take me about two months to produce. And so uh, that's two months that I won't be writing books. So anyway, uh, my next project is going to be uh, something that is probably bigger than the database work, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a really ambitious thing to try. And I, I don't know that, I don't know how, how well it's going to end. <laughs> now I said that with my sales database, but I, I always reset things. Um, you know, it, it, I'm glad that I had some success with it. It gave me some experience and some knowledge, and I think it'll help me with this next project that I'm going to be talking about next. So one of the things that I've always said is that, and I, I've said this probably for the last six to eight months, um, and particularly in context with AI, but I think in, in, in terms of technology in general, as writers, we need to be thinking about technology that will make us a better version of ourselves. As we think about becoming technology-driven writers, which is the future, as we think about becoming data-driven writers, which is the future that I don't know that a whole lot of people are thinking about, and then as we think about becoming the writers of the future, I think that becoming a, be a better version of yourself is important. And the way we do that is through technology. And it's amazing how the technology that is out there today, it's almost invisible, but there's so much technology out there that can help us become better versions of ourselves without having to spend a whole lot of money you just have to know the right know-how. So where I'm getting at with this is that when I'm writing a book, I have no need for um, Grammarly or a similar writing app to tell me about my commas or to tell me about this or that. You know, they, they do a good job, but they're not going to really help me at the end of the day um, eliminate typos at the level that I truly need them or eliminate errors I should say not typos but errors at the level that I need them what I want and this is this is like maybe a pipe dream <laughs> I don't know I don't know what this is going to look like but I'm walking down that path is what I want is to be able to take edits that my last editor gave me 
and be able to have some sort of software identify those edits as I'm writing my next book or be able to click a button and it identify the errors that I've made in the past today before I send my next book back to the editor, right? I mean, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's, it's better than what we have today. I mean, today you, you, you have a couple options. You can use Microsoft Spell Checker, which we all know how accurate Microsoft Spell Checker is. We can use Grammarly or Pro Writing Aid, and that's it. You know, that's all we have. I need something that can help me. It, it, that's almost like a, like a positive feedback loop. The more mistakes I make, the more feedback I can give the system, and then the more errors it can help me catch. I don't know if that's quite a feedback loop, <laughs> but you, you, you understand where I'm going with that. And so what I want, what I want to try to build, uh, and like I said, this is, this is kind of crazy. I, I don't know why I'm even trying to do this because I, I might have bitten, bitten off more than I can chew, is I want to try to develop some sort of system where I can feed in grammatical rules and then have it identify those rules. So let me give you an example of this. Let's say, like in my last, in my last book, um, the editor called out that I, um, the, the, she has this style thing, I think it's Chicago manual style, or it's some manual style, I forget what it is, where if, if, the, if you use a number in a sentence, if the number is less than 10, you write it out. And if it's greater than 10, you use the numerals, right? So wouldn't it be interesting if I could take that rule, if you see the word, the, the, the numbers 1 through 10 written out, if they're written out or if they're used as numerals, then they need to be written out, right? Or if you see the word 50 and it's written out as the word and not the numerals, then it needs to be the numerals, wouldn't it be interesting if I could program something to catch that? You know, that's like a little, that's like a little thing, you know, or, or what if, um, like another edit that she gave me, uh, was that I used the word, um, I used the word cadence incorrectly in a sentence. Now I may never use that word cor incorrectly ever again, but wouldn't it be interesting if I could have a system, anytime I use the word cadence, it highlights that word so that I can remember, hey, wait a minute, I, I didn't use that word right the last time. Let me double check that I used it right this time. So it's almost like it's almost like a style guide, but you're programming it with rules that your editor has given you in the past. And it can involve commas, it can involve semicolons, it can involve the, the two examples that I gave, which I'm sure there are, are more simpler examples, I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Um, but a lot of them are just really straightforward and, and simple things right now here's here's the problem i recognize that there have been linguists and computer programmers and far smarter people than me i, I have average intelligence who have tried to solve this problem and they have failed because the english language is extraordinarily difficult to reduce down to code it just it just is i mean if, if it wasn't then we would have uh, software that would would handle all of our problems for us, right? But I was I was doing some research, and um, uh, I happened to be looking into some data science stuff. You know, one of my one of my things I've been trying to do every night before I fall to fall asleep is to learn a little bit more about artificial intelligence and data science. And I happened to be watching a video on natural language processing, which is an offshoot of artificial intelligence. And what natural language processing does is it takes words and it reduces them down to something that a computer can understand. So like the smart speaker in your room, that is an example of natural language processing. It's doing natural language processing in virtual real time to convert the words that you speak into text that a computer can understand so that it can answer your question. And, and so the way natural language processing works is, is exactly that. And I was looking at a, a couple of other things. I was, look, I was looking at some programming languages. I don't know why I wasn't looking at that. And, and I, w I got some dots that were kind of connecting. And I was thinking, huh, 
what if I could take the edits that my editor recommended and I could turn those edits into if then statements. So if you use the word interval in a sentence or cadence in a sentence, then highlight the term so that I can review it, right? Or if the, the, if you use, um, you know, I don't know, a certain word in a sentence, highlight it. Um, or if, uh, the comma precedes a certain type of phrase, then highlight the sentence on the page, right? All things that I have mistakes that I've made in the past. And what if I could take a certain percentage of those mistakes and I could turn them into if then statements, because if I can do that, then a computer can understand the if then statements in theory, right? So, and then, and then what if I could use natural language processing, artificial intelligence to take the words that I've written and reduce those words down into code to help me with that. Now, that, when I first had that idea, I was like, okay, this is crazy. <laughs> Why would I do that? Because I'm not, I, I don't know anything about artificial intelligence. I don't know anything about anything, you know? And, and I was thinking to myself, because in order to do that, in order to reduce your words down into code, the system would have to have some way to understand what each word is, right? So like, if, if you have a, a situation where you're, the rule needs to check a verb, well, the system has to know that what it's looking at is a verb. It has to know where all the verbs in the sentence are. It has to know where all the adjectives are. It has to know where all the determiners and the, and the conjunctions and the articles and things are, right? So I was like, well, I can't be the only person who has thought about this. There has to be some work that's already been done here, right? So I started looking at open source stuff and I was kind of floored. There's a there's so much open source stuff out there where these researchers have done a lot of this work and you can get the benefit of it by just linking up to the open source. And so there's one in particular, uh, it was the Princeton, Princeton University WordNet, where they have mapped um, the majority of the words in the English language into part, parts of speech that a computer can understand. So if you take the Princeton Dictionary or the Princeton Corpus is what, what they would call it. And then you take another op open source AI for natural language processing. Essentially what it will do for you is it will take all of uh, the words and, and, and it's basically a model essentially is what you're doing is you're, you're basically hooking your data up to an open source model and it will take your sentences and reduce them down to code and it will tag each word with a part of speech so that it will change your sentences so that it'll say, like if, if, if you said the word, the clever brown fox, or the, the phrase, the clever brown fox, it would say uh, the hyphen or the underscore article, clever underscore adjective, uh, brown underscore adjective, fox underscore noun. I'm being a little simplistic here, but it would look something kind of similar to that. And so then, then you can start programming rules into this. Now, again, I, I'm walking down a path I've kind of never been down before, and I know my terminology is not 100% precise, um, but I'm still learning this. But my, my goal is I think I can do this by myself or with minimum help is to take this open source natural language processing, this library or this model, so to speak, feed my book through that model and then have the model reduce it down to code. And then with a little bit of Java or a little bit of Python programming, take that code and do something with it into Microsoft Word, right? So basically feed the text through a natural language processor to reduce everything down to code then use programming if then statements or certain programming syntax to basically create a word doc that will do something with the text you know it's interesting it's interesting i don't i don't know where we'll end up but my ultimate goal is to be able to take my finished manuscript feed it through whatever this app 
or system is that I want to try to create and then have it make recommendations to me based on the prior edits that I've, I've had. I don't, this is kind of crazy. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to do this, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting experiment um, because it's, it's so contrary to what other, other people in companies in this space are doing. Everyone right now is going toward developmental editing, right? We want to build models to help you improve your story structure, right? I have not seen anybody do this. Let's take, let's take the edits that you've made in your last book and then let's help you prevent, prevent yourself from making those same edits. I mean, isn't that the whole purpose of what we want artificial intelligence to be? I mean, don't we want computers to help us be better versions of ourselves? I mean, isn't that the whole purpose? I don't know. Um, anyway, that's what I'm going to try to work on. I'm not in any rush, but I'm, I'm definitely learning a lot. And um, as I continue learning, I, I know that my uh, way of explaining this will get better. It will get crisper. But I hope something I said has resonated. It made sense. Um, who knows? Who knows where we'll end up here? But if this is if this succeeds, this would also be a huge infrastructure win, especially if I can figure out a way to do it myself. Um, you know, it's going to involve learning some programming languages, possibly, but that's not really a big deal for me. I like learning new languages. It's not really a problem. Um, I think it's because I, I mean, I'm fluent in Spanish, and so I think once I figured that out, how to become fluent in Spanish, um, speaking Spanish all day, like learning languages and learning syntax and stuff is just really not a problem for me. So anyway, that's what I'm going to be trying. So that'll be kind of my uh, my side project while I've got my beast mode on. So if anybody happens to have a, a degree in data science or uh, happens to know Python or natural language processing with Python, let me know. <laughs> authorlevelup.com slash contact. I always like to throw that out there because I never know who's listening. All right. So I would love to chat with anyone who has expertise in this area and uh, let me know if I'm off my rocker or uh, if maybe I'm on to something. So anyway, I hope everybody's doing great. Hope everybody is staying happy and healthy, and I will plan on talking to you next week. But in the meantime, I've got a beast mode i got to attend to. Take care. Thanks for joining me this week. If you enjoyed this episode, you'll enjoy my backlist episodes at michaelaron.com slash podcast. For your free starter library of my favorite novels, join my fan club by visiting michaelaron.com slash fan club. If you're a writer and want to connect with me further, check out my YouTube channel, Author Level Up, for helpful writing advice at authorlevelup.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week.